Happy Mother's Day. We're so glad that you're here with us for our service today. And you know, speaking of our service, this one is extra special as today we're going to be dedicating some children within our New Hope family. So let's go ahead and jump into our service today. Well, happy Mother's Day and welcome to New Hope Church. We're so glad you're here with us today. My name is Adam. I serve as a senior pastor here and my wife. Uh, Morgan is joining me because we're going to start off our service today uh, doing a child dedication. We've got three groups of uh, families who are going to be dedicating their children today, and uh, we're really excited that you're going to be a part of this with us today. So we're going to introduce you to some of the kids. Yeah, you go ahead and cheer for them. That's all right. A little enthusiastic. I like that. I like that. So I'm going to come down through here and give you guys the opportunity to introduce us to who's being dedicated today. Okay. Oh, my name is Aya Bancole, and I'm dedicating Abigail Bancole and Amelia Bancole today. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. You you might want to do this. Okay. Uh, Hi, we're dedicating our son, Landon Bautista. Awesome. Landon. 17 days. Oh, so precious. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Armando. This is my wife, Jennifer, uh, our daughter, Rosalia, and our son, Nicholas. Nicholas, what's up, buddy? Come on. Hi. There's too many people going on. Too many things going on. Hi. My name is Autumn, and this is my son, Caleb. Caleb, what's up, buddy? <laughs> you say hi? So say hi. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Come on. Dude. Future preacher right there. I like that. Hi, my name is Priscilla, and this is his godmom, Michelle, and we are here to dedicate Eli. Eli. Hi, I'm Ashley, and this is my husband, Ryan, and we're dedicating Maggie. Hey, Maggie. Hi, I'm Faith. This is Dominic, and this is Theodore. He's being dedicated today. Hey, Theodore. You want to say hi? Can you say hi? Oh, this is Theodore. Theodore says he's glad all of you are here. So, uh, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, y'all give them a hand, and they're going to exit this way. We're going to bring our next group up on stage. And as they are making their way off, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what a child dedication is and what it is not. Child dedication is not about the salvation of these children. In many ways, uh, we should probably call it a parent dedication. It's an opportunity for these parents to commit themselves before their church family uh, to raising these children in a way uh, where they point the children to Jesus with the hope that one day uh, the child gets to a place in his or her life where they recognize their need for a savior, um, ask Jesus to come into their life and save them. And so we love doing this in front of our church family because it takes a community of faith to come alongside these parents uh, and help them and to encourage them. Many of you will serve these kids in the nursery or the preschool or elementary or student ministry as they get older. And um, so it's a really beautiful thing that we get to do together as a church family. So we got our next uh, round up here with us. And so we're gonna introduce y'all to these uh, children who have been dedicated today. I'm Amber. This is my husband, Charles, and we're dedicating our daughter, Dawson. Hey, Dawson. Good job. This is fun. Sorry, too much going on. There's too much going on. Hi. Hey, my name is Lori, and this is my husband, Chad, and we're dedicating our son, Gabriel Hammermeister. Hey, Gabriel. Hey, buddy. Hi. Hi, my name is Trisha, and I'm here dedicating my daughter, Kaylee. Kaylee. Good morning, my name is Rob. This is my wife, Allison, and we're here to dedicate our beautiful baby girl, Alyssa. Alyssa, hi. Hi, my name's Alexis. I'm here to dedicate my son, Carson. Carson, what's up, buddy? (laughs) I'm Sarah Lynn. This is my husband, Dennis, and we are dedicating our four boys, Lynn, Tripp, Leo, and Henry. Wow. Yeah. That's right. right. Oh, he's in the Bible. All right. Good morning. My name is Rachel. My husband, Gabriel, and we're dedicating our son, Keelan. Oh, he's so precious. Hi. So good. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. My name is Anil Omi. She's Anusha Omi. 
We are dedicating Anish Samuel Raj Omi and Anchika Joyce Omi. Awesome. So great. All right, y'all let them know how proud of them we are. Round three. So good. I have family, I had four boys, right? So uh, four boys. So Morgan and I dedicated all three of our boys. They are now 14, 12, and eight. And we dedicated all three of them on the first Mother's Day um, after they were born. So this day holds a special day in our hearts uh, for their dedications um, and also watching them kind of grow in their spiritual development. You may have noticed that Morgan is giving out um, to each one of these families a Bible for each one of these children. They're also gonna get a certificate this week um, in the mail, a letter commemorating today, and then a letter directed and addressed to the child from me so the child can open that letter on the day of his or her salvation. And we wanna let these children know that we prayed for them on this day. And so that's a day that we can certainly look forward to with great faith. And so we're gonna introduce round three of our 11 o'clock service of the families and the children that are being dedicated today. I'm Jesse, this is my wife, Chloe, and we're dedicating our sons, both Eli and Emmett. Eli and Emmett, what's up, buddy? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> my name is Chucho, I'm my wife Tiffany, and we come to the IK Ru Valentina Quintero. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Um, I'm Brad, this is Autumn, and we're dedicating our daughter, Sayla Roth, today. Awesome. Hey, Sayla. Hey. Good morning. My name is Tanisha, this is Dominique, and we're dedicating our son, Jaira, and our daughter, Carson. I love it. Jaira. Congratulations. Hello. Um, my name is Tyasia. This is her father, Alex, and we're dedicating to Mia. To Mia. Hi. You want to say hi? Yeah, yeah. Oh. She'll take a bite of it. It's all right. That was funny. I agree. I like that. Absolutely. I'm Nicole. This is my husband, Brett, and we're dedicating Brett Jr. Brett Jr. I love it. Hey, buddy. Hi. Hi, I'm Brittany. This is my husband, Scott, and we're dedicating our daughter, Camden. Camden, <laughs> so beautiful. Hi. Hi, my name is Ashley. This is my husband, Justin, and we're, today we're dedicating Jackson. Jackson, awesome. All right. So we've got a lot of families, a lot of kids up here, and I'm going to um, grab this right here and read a few dedications here for all of our families today. And so parents, Morgan gave each of you the Bibles, and I just wanna challenge you to, to read God's word from an early age with your children. Uh, this is the Jesus Storybook Bible. We use these with our boys, and um, it really is an amazing thing to just kind of help them as they grow in their discovery of who Jesus is. And so parents, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read some dedications. I'm gonna ask you to simply respond by saying we do. And then church family, Morgan will be reading, reading some dedications and asking all of you to respond by saying we do as well. So parents, as parents, we promise to care for and raise this child in a God-honoring way so that when he or she is old enough, they will commit their life to Jesus and become a follower of him. We commit to do this by praying for our child daily, teaching our child about Jesus and God's eternal principles from the Bible, faithfully attending church with our child, and modeling a Christ-like life at work, in the home, in our marriage, and as parents. Parents, if you make these commitments, say, we do. All right, church, as the church, we promise to support, encourage, and care for these children and families by praying for them faithfully, being their spiritual family, modeling through our collective lives what it means to be a Christian, walking beside these families as these children grow in spiritual knowledge and understanding. Church, if you make these commitments, say, we do. And so church family, I wanna invite each of you to just extend your hand as we symbolically pray over these children today. And so God, we wanna come before you right now and do just that. We wanna thank you for creating each one of these children in your image, for creating them with a distinct purpose for their lives, for, for gifting them, for calling them by name, for blessing these parents with these children, Lord, we say thank you. Lord, we pray for these parents as well, that you would encourage them with your Holy Spirit, encourage them through your word, and encourage them with your people. And God, may we look forward by faith to the day that each one of these children ask Jesus to come into their lives 
as their personal Lord and Savior. So thank you for letting us be a part of this day. Thank you for a church that values, loves, and celebrates children. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's let all these families know how proud of them we are today. April the 10th, 1970. You came into my life at nine pounds, 11 and a half ounces. I wondered what kind of woman you would become. Would you be rambunctious like when you tricked your father into buying you that baby blue 10 speed? Would you become a musician all the time we spent going to those band contests? Would you love, would you be hurt? Would I be there to hold you up? But most of all, I wondered if I'd do enough, if I'd be able to prepare you for all the things in this world. Would I be able to see you drop that 10 speed for a real car, become a successful independent woman, and to become a mother? January 24th, 1996, you came into my life at eight pounds, six ounces. Your grandma held you, and I remember that she said that you were the most beautiful baby girl and that you looked just like me. She's my best friend and the strongest person I have ever known. She raised me, and it was my turn to raise you. I still have all of your old school things. Do you remember the writing assignment that you did in first grade? It meant the world to me. It's been my mission to show you how to be independent and strong and to be able to handle anything life threw at you, and to teach you that God would always provide, just as he did for mom and me. I loved watching you grow at New Hope, watching you and grandma getting baptized together overflowed my heart with joy and gratitude to our father. Grandma and I will always be there for you. My mother taught me how to be your mom, and I know I can count on her for anything. I hope you know that you too can count on anything from your mom. February 5th, 2019, my son was born. I can't believe it, I'm a mom. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not sure if I ever will. The other day he was riding in his little Jeep. I think he takes after you. When he laughs, he sounds just like you. When he smiles, I can't help but to think that time we dressed him up like an avocado. He was the cutest avocado I have ever seen. I don't know how you did it all, but I'm so thankful I have you as my mom. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. And I love you both. I love you, Mommy. Love you, Grandma. Love you, Nana. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Good morning, church. We'd like to invite you to stand if you're able. And happy Mother's Day. Let's make praise our weapon today. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. 
let us continue to worship and give God all the glory and all the praise. They say this mountain can be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. Come on, you sound good. We've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can.
Let's pray. God, we come before you and we thank you that you are a God we can place our belief in. And we thank you that when we do that, you do not fail. Your promises are trustworthy. Your word is truth. And so God, we choose today to say that we are going to trust in you. So would you come and meet with us, speak to us, show us a new thing as our attention is on you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we all said together, amen. Well, today we're in part six of our series, Jesus Unscripted. So let's go ahead and open up the Gospel of Mark together and learn from Pastor Adam today. Well, thanks and welcome. It's great to see all of you here on our campus. Let me welcome everybody joining us online. If you are on our campus, um, I don't see any empty seats, but if you have one beside you, if you can slide in, I know we got a lot of people out in the lobby um, in an overflow area. Maybe our ushers are still trying to help some people find a seat um, so you can help them out with that. It's a fun day. It's Mother's Day, and uh, we've mentioned it a few times, but I just wanna start our time off by uh, honoring the moms in the house. And so if you're here on our campus and you're a mom, would you stand up just for a second so that we can honor you, let you know how much we love you, how much we appreciate you. Look at all the moms. So good. Thank you so much. And moms, on your way out today, uh, we have a free gift for you. In fact, uh, we have a free gift for all of the women who are here today um, at New Hope. It's this pretty amazing book. It's called Jesus Always. It's a 365-day uh, devotional by Sarah Young, and um, our guest services team is gonna have those for you ladies on your way out today. So make sure uh, you get that. We hope it's something that encourages you and can certainly help you in your, on your own faith journey. Now, maybe you're just jumping in today. You're a guest. We're so honored you're here. We've been in this series now for quite a while, going through the Gospel of Mark. We're calling it Jesus Unscripted because that's what happens a lot of times in Mark. We're doing one thing, and all of a sudden, Jesus kind of starts doing something else. We're going to see that in our passage today. So if you have a Bible, Mark chapter 5 is where we're going to be. And if you don't, we'll put all the verses up here for you. And the title of the message is Jesus and His Daughters. And we're going to see Jesus interacting with some individuals who he refers to as his daughters. And I thought that would be appropriate for us to talk about on Mother's Day as we celebrate and honor all of Jesus's daughters who are here with us today. We're gonna go through the story, kind of a few verses at a time. I'll give you an application you might wanna jot down if you're taking notes, but let me kind of summarize the story first, and then we'll back up and work our way through it. So Jesus is surrounded by crowds. This is not uncommon. There's an individual who comes to him. His name is Jairus. His daughter is deathly ill. We'll find out she's about 12 years old. He asked Jesus to come to his home and heal him. On the way to his home, Jesus is interrupted by another woman who is in need of healing. She has an issue that causes her to bleed. Jesus is going to heal her. He's then gonna go to Jairus' house. The 12-year-old daughter has already died. Jesus is gonna raise her from the dead. So he ends up healing two daughters. We can just pray and go home. I told you the whole story, right? <laughs> Saved everybody time, all right? Now, I would prefer you not do that because as we go back through it, I think that the power is in the details and it's where we can actually see some things that we can apply to our lives. And so I'm gonna be starting in verse 21 of Mark chapter five and we'll start working our way through this story. So when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. One of the synagogue leaders, that's key, named Jairus, came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying, please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed 
and live. A synagogue was kind of like a smaller version of the temple. If you're new to the Bible, Old Testament temple, it's where God's people, the Hebrew people, went to worship. There was one temple in Jerusalem. There were many synagogues spread out all over Israel. If you were a synagogue leader, you served under the authority of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So it's key that the text tells us that he was a leader of a synagogue because the Pharisees and the Sadducees were in conflict with Jesus for a number of different reasons in the New Testament. And it's important for us to see that this particular synagogue leader, Jairus, sought out Jesus when his daughter was in need of healing. And it's our first application that I wanna make for us today. You see, sometimes seeking Jesus means you actually have to leave other voices behind. The voices in Jairus' life, the authority in his life, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, would not have approved of Jairus seeking Jesus out. And yet at his point of desperation, this is what he does. He recognizes, and he's probably grateful for the investment that they've made in his life, but he sees, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to go to this Savior, and I'm going to see what he can do for my daughter. And many of you maybe here today can identify with that. Perhaps you've had a mentor in your life, or maybe even in a moment of vulnerability, it might have been your own mom. Sometimes on Mother's Day, we don't acknowledge that not everybody had a great experience with their mom. It can be challenging sometimes in life to recognize that people who were in authority of us, people who perhaps mentored us, people who at some point in our lives we actually had to submit ourselves to, there comes a place where sometimes we can go, I think I'm gonna go a new way. I actually want to pursue this person named Jesus. I wanna open myself up towards spiritual things, even if the people who have shaped me didn't necessarily guide me in that direction. And if that's where you are, I wanna encourage you to move forward with humility, to move forward with discernment, but to recognize that ultimately all of us have to decide whether or not we will lean into Jesus, we will seek Jesus, we will pursue Jesus. And if you have to do that at the expense of guidance you've received from someone else, then you can identify a little bit with where Jairus was on this particular day. And so he comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus to come with him so that Jesus will heal his daughter. Verse 24, Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Let me give you the second application we see from our story today, and it's an encouragement to you. Don't let the disappointment from others keep you from Jesus. That's what she had to overcome. Did you see what the story said? A bunch of doctors. Not only did they not help her, they took advantage of her, and the text says they made it worse. She's been let down over and over by people, and yet, boy, she just wasn't gonna quit. She just had a level of perseverance in her that I really liked. She was not gonna let the overall disappointment that others had caused keep her from Jesus, and somebody here today needs to hear that, okay? Because let me tell you what I know about Christ followers. We will disappoint you. Let me tell you what I know about pastors. We will disappoint you. Let me tell you what I know about churches. We will disappoint you. See, church hurts are a real thing. And many people have been hurt by churches. And the reason why people have been hurt by churches is because churches are full of flawed people. And sometimes what can happen is in the midst of our hurt that's very real, and very legitimate, we can sometimes let that keep us from Jesus. Let me encourage you today not to do that. Don't let the disappointments of others, the failures of others, the hurt that maybe others have caused in your life keep you from Jesus. Don't give them that much power. You let Jesus be Jesus. You let Jesus be who he is, and you pursue him, and that's exactly what this lady did, and I so admire her for doing that. And then there's another thing that she did that I think we can all learn from as well. You see, whatever you know about Jesus, let me encourage you, start your pursuit from there. Because at the end of the day, I'm not trying to take a shot, but like the lady here, who the woman who's in need of healing, it's not the best theology, y'all. I'm just being honest. Like she's got an issue she needs to be healed, and in her mind, she's like, maybe if I touch his robe? I don't know. Like, there's nothing in the Old Testament that suggests that. 
There's nothing for Jesus' three years of public ministry that would somehow suggest that if you do this, this is now how you'll be healed. Now, after this account, that actually starts to happen. People think, man, just touch his robe. It happened to her, it could happen to me. But at this point, that's not really anything that somebody would have thought. Here's the whole point. She thought it. She had a perhaps moment. You ever had a perhaps moment? where you're looking at something and it seems impossible and the slow voice goes, perhaps God could move on your behalf. That's good. That's real good. But sometimes we don't pursue the perhaps. We just think, no, I don't think so. I need to learn a little bit more about Jesus. Let me encourage you. Whatever you know about Jesus, start your pursuit from there. For some of you, the extent of that might be today's message. Maybe someone invited you here today. You, you wanted to be here to watch the, your friend dedicate their child. We're so glad you're here. The whole spirituality, the whole Jesus thing, you know, something you're not really on board with, but, but you're not closed-minded as well. Perhaps by the end of this message, you've got a little bit now that you could begin your pursuit. Sometimes people who have been around church a little longer think that they need to learn a lot more about Jesus before they can begin their pursuit. Not the case. Whatever you know about Jesus right now, Start your pursuit from there. In fact, let me challenge you a little bit, maybe, maybe even offend you a little bit on Mother's Day. Can I do that? I don't know if I can, I'll be honest, right? We'll find out in about 30 seconds, but let me offend you here, okay? If you go to church on a semi-regular basis every now and then, and you listen to somebody teach the Bible, perhaps you listen to a podcast or you know, you've read a couple books or whatever, if you fit that description, you know more about the Bible than 50% of the people on the planet. There's a bunch of people living on the planet right now. The Bible hasn't even been translated into their language yet. And praise God, there are missionaries who are working diligently to make that happen. So many times we think that we need to be educated in a far greater way before we can begin our pursuit. Many of us are far educated beyond our level of obedience. So why not just take a step right now from what it is that you actually know? I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon, a famous pastor from the 1800s in London. I think he does a really good job of, of framing this when it comes to our pursuit. You see, he says, some of you sit still and hope that the Lord will visit you. You wait by the pool till an angel will come and stir the water and all that kind of thing. But that is not according to the tenor of the gospel command, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Exercise the personal, voluntary, intentional act of faith and you shall be saved. That's a good word for all of us to heed. You're not going to aimlessly find your way to Jesus. You need to pursue. You need to pursue him from wherever you're at, from wherever you're at. For this lady, that meant I've got this issue. I hope he can heal me. I'm gonna touch his robe and we'll see what happens. Well, look what happened for her, verse 29. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. She knew something had happened. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the pe people crowding against you, his disciple answered. These guys were always pointing out the obvious. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. I mean, there's so many times that Jesus could have said something he didn't. What amazing restraint. <laughs> We could all learn from that, right? We could all learn from that. They're like, you see all the crowd against you, and yet you ask, you touch me. Jesus ignored them. He kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Interesting phrase, trembling with fear. She didn't know what was gonna happen here. She told him the truth. Which, by the way, a little mini sermon, even if you're trembling with fear, tell the truth. Okay, just tell the truth. Kids, if you're here with mom, tell her the truth, okay? Never hurts to tell the truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. Here's the principle for us today. Personal acts of faith become public testimonies. It's a personal act of faith. She's, she's gonna touch his robe. She's gonna hope that she will be healed. Jesus actually heals her and then gives her this amazing opportunity for a public testimony. So there's a lot of things happening here that I think are worth unpacking. First of all, it's an incredible gift. See, sometimes... People who are a little bit more introverted don't necessarily think that being given the opportunity to speak publicly is a gift, okay? Now, if y'all had to vote, do you think I'm introverted or extroverted, okay? Yeah, I don't even know what the word introvert means, okay? 
Just yesterday, we were out at this, I don't even know what it was, but there were lots of things we, we could buy. It's like a craft show. I'm totally butchering that, aren't I? Anyway, so like we're there and there's all these crafts and it was fantastic, y'all. And we're looking around and we're picking out Mother's Day gifts and we're getting ready to leave and these four ladies are trying to get a selfie, right? I'm one of those people that when I see that, I think that's my mission in life to help them. So I go up to them. I'm like, y'all need some help? And they're like, we do. And I take the phone and they had it on the selfie mode because, you know, they'd been trying to do this. Well, they hand me the phone. So the first thing I did was take a picture of myself, just like that. <laughs> I did. So these four ladies have a picture of me on their phone now. And they're probably like, what a weirdo. But then I did hit the appropriate button and flip it around. I took their picture. I moved on with my day. That's what us extroverts do. My guess is that this lady was a little bit more of an introvert. She's kind of trying to blend in. She doesn't really want to be singled out. But see, here's what Jesus knew. He was giving her an incredible gift by singling her out. Because according to Old Testament law, she had been defined as unclean. She could not experience community friendship or relationships with other people. Her own family couldn't be around her. Marriage was out of the question for her, And scripture says she knew she had been healed. She knew something had happened. But see, this would have been very challenging for her to convince the people in her life that knew this issue existed that she had actually been healed. So what does Jesus do? He gives her an amazing gift to publicly say what's happened, for him to validate what's happening, telling everyone she has been healed, opening up the amazing opportunity for her to be invited back into a community of faith. What a gift that Jesus gave her by allowing her to speak about this publicly. That was a gift. But then I think she needed the opportunity to tell everybody what had happened as well. And for some of you, just for a second, I think that's where you might be. See, I bet in a room this size with this many people, with everybody joining us online, some of y'all, you've asked Jesus to come into your life recently. And he saved you. And you know something's changed. Your desires have started to change. You actually want to be at church. You're starting to read your Bible. There's a peace that has settled in. All of life's problems haven't gone away, but there's this peace that's settled in. You can't quite explain it, but you know you've asked Jesus to come into your life. But see, here's the thing. You haven't told anyone. You haven't told anyone. You've experienced your own personal miracle of salvation. And here's what Jesus would invite you into today, an opportunity to have a public testimony. See, a lot of times at the end of our services, I'll give people the opportunity to respond and ask Jesus to come into their life. We do that a lot here at New Hope. And I would say over the last six to eight weeks, I mean, I, I don't count when we're doing that. I look so I can pray for you. I would say over the last six to eight weeks, we've had hundreds of people raise their hands. Over the last six to eight weeks, I think we've, hundreds of people have experienced salvation here at New Hope Church. And over the last couple of months, we've baptized around 75, 80 people. Now, I'm not that great at math, but 75, 80 people, that's a lot of people being baptized, but there's a lot of people, and, and you may be one of these individuals, you've asked Jesus to come into your life. You just haven't gone public yet with your faith through baptism, and that's what baptism is. Baptism is your opportunity to have a public testimony. It's not what saves you, it's how you show everybody that you've made this decision. So hey, if that's you, can I encourage you, scan that QR code, get signed up to get baptized. Baptisms are big celebrations. We're gonna celebrate, we're gonna cheer, it's gonna be awesome, and it's gonna be your opportunity to have a public testimony. And see, for some of you, this would be super helpful because you have some friends who don't know Jesus and they're wondering why you're a little different now. Okay, You can get baptized and invite them to your baptism and they'll come because they've heard of baptism and, and they'll come and they'll show up and they'll cheer for you and they'll celebrate you. But see, it'll make it a little easier when the following Friday night circles around and they're ready to go out and do all the stuff you used to do. They won't invite you anymore. <laughs> and some of y'all need that level of accountability, all right? <laughs> I'm just saying this is why Jesus gave us the beautiful gift of baptism. So let's learn from this account and let's see how we can apply it into our lives. But verse 34, the way Jesus kind of wrapped up this whole conversation with her. I read it. Let me circle back around to it. Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. First of all, he says, it's your faith that healed you. It's the faith that led you to touch my robe. It's healed you. 
And, and the word that he's using here when he talks about healing her is the same word, and being made well, some of your translations may say, is the same word that's actually used to describe the act of salvation. There's a spiritual healing that's happening here as well from the faith that she has displayed. But remarkably, Jesus calls her daughter. It's the only time Jesus ever used this word, daughter. This lady showed up that day as an outcast, as a woman with a label, as a woman with no community. She meets Jesus, he heals her, and she leaves a daughter of the king for the rest of her life. For the rest of her life, a daughter of the king. Remarkable. And that's what Jesus does. He rescues, he redeems, he saves, he gives us a new name. But see, here's the thing. The whole time this beautiful account's happening, Jairus is hanging out over here, probably getting a little impatient. I mean, how are you supposed to interrupt this whole beautiful thing that's happening? But as a father, all he's thinking about is his daughter. And see, I think Jesus was up to something. I think he wanted the woman who he just healed to recognize you're one of my daughters, but I also think he wanted Jairus to understand, hey, I still got it with your daughter too, don't you worry, okay? Because I'm Jesus and I can think about daughters and so I'm healing this daughter, I'll eventually heal your daughter. But see, I think there's some daughters in the house that would also need to hear from Jesus today as well. So it's our next observation. You see, Jesus' daughters only find full acceptance in him. So big. I can't imagine how difficult it is to be a godly woman in today's world because our world tells women over and over who they should be, what they should be, whose affection they should be seeking, how they should be defined, that their worth and value is determined from the outside in when God's word says, no, it's from the inside out. And if you're a woman walking with God... You can find full acceptance as Jesus' daughter. And I wrote the word acceptance because, see, I'm actually a guy. I don't know if y'all knew that. I'm a guy, all right? <laughs> Make sure you're all on the same page. And so I'm doing the best I can, sisters in Christ, to suggest, hey, maybe it's acceptance, that you can experience full acceptance as a daughter of the king, but, but it might be purpose, it might be value, it might be love, it might be beauty. What, what is it that you need at a soul level? And here's what I want you to hear, my sister in Christ. It's, it's Jesus that can meet that need, that you will only find that fully in him, fully in him. Sisters in Christ, listen, do not let somebody else's label that they've placed on you define you. Mm -mm. Don't let it happen. Don't let who this world tells you you're supposed to be sink into your heart. Don't let that happen. Don't let your past define your present. Don't let that happen, okay? I marvel at watching my wife walk with Jesus. See, when I met my wife, she hadn't been a Christian very long, and there was just a light about her, and I was just drawn to it, and I... I, I I couldn't help myself. I was just drawn to it. And if I can just get real for a second, boy, I'm about to get in trouble. But if I could just get real for a second, I had dated some church girls. I hadn't dated a godly girl. Difference. 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 And I watched this woman, and she walks with Jesus. And here's, here's the most remarkable thing about my wife. She knows who she married. And here's what she knows about me. Flawed, rescued, and redeemed by a savior as well. The thing that I love about my wife, hold up, I'm gonna let y'all cheer real loud for a second. The thing I love about my wife <laughs> is she's never looked to me to fulfill what only Jesus can be for her in her life. Now you can cheer, right? And I'm grateful for that. That's, how, that's the only way our marriage works, is we both look to Jesus to be 
what only he can be in our lives. And, and our marriage is based on the foundation for that. And, and I just wanna encourage you, ladies, whatever it is you're walking through today, I hope you have godly people in your lives. I hope you have godly friends. If you are married, I hope your, your husband is serving you in the name of Jesus. But first and foremost, always go to Jesus and tell him what you need and you will experience full acceptance as one of his daughters as well. So this beautiful account is happening and Jesus heals her and it's remarkable. And then verse 35 it, it kind of, the moment just goes because some people show up and they don't know how to read a room. So verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, he's still speaking, he is still speaking. This is Jesus, y'all, not like, you, you know, this Jesus. Like if you interrupt Jesus, I just got issues with you, but this is Jesus, okay? <laughs> Jesus is still speaking. Some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. Moment gone. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, who's him, Jairus? Jesus told Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Here's the application for all of us. You gotta choose whose voice you're gonna listen to. You gotta choose, daily, daily I might add. Can you imagine? This lady gets healed and Jairus is like, we gotta get to my daughter right about that time. These people show up and they basically say, don't even bother, she's dead. And in real time, Jesus looks at him and says, hey man, you gotta choose who you're gonna believe here right now. Like keep believing. And, and Jairus has the faith to keep believing. And church, if nobody's told you this lately, there's gonna be a lot of voices in your life trying to tell you not to walk with Jesus, not to move forward with God to give up on this whole faith, that God hasn't come through for you yet, that you're a fool, that why would you believe these things? Why would you continue to go to church? Why would you continue to read your Bible? And you've gotta choose whose voice you're gonna to listen to. It's a choice, it's a choice. There's so many points in our life where we just have to choose which road are we gonna go down. And guys, many times, many times in our life, the road that seemed most obvious, where the conclusion was just foregone and we already knew what was gonna happen, was the road that would have been guided by voices that would have doubted, that would have taken shots, that would have mocked, that would have questioned. And then there's like this one tiny little trail over here with a little light called faith. And you just step into that and you just keep moving forward and you just say, you know what? I'm gonna walk by faith, not by sight. I'm not gonna fix my eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen. And I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna listen to the right voices. Listen, the reason why so many voices in our lives get so loud is we never counter them with the truth. That's why you gotta get in God's word, church. You gotta get in God's word. Listen, I hope when you come to church, you're encouraged and, and, and God's word speaks to you through me, empowered by the Holy Spirit. I hope you get into a group. I hope you do this. I hope you do that. I hope you pray. But nothing replaces you getting into God's word every single day. You go to God's word and you say, God, there's a bunch of voices in my life trying to tell me who I'm supposed to be and tell me what I'm supposed to do. And I'm gonna open up your word and I need you to speak to me right now. And the Holy Spirit will enlighten God's word in your life. But you've got to choose whose voice you're going to listen to. You can listen to God's voice or you can listen to the voice of the world. But if you listen to God's voice, you keep walking by faith. And that's exactly what Jairus did that day. So they keep going. Verse 37. And Jesus did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader Jairus, Jesus saw a commotion, all the people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep, but they laughed at him. So let's stop here for a second. Jairus' daughter was really dead. When Jesus says she's asleep, that's synonymous with the term for death. It's the same word Jesus used when describing Lazarus, who had been in a tomb for four days. So she's really dead. And the moment he says that, it says that these people start laughing at him. Just a few moments earlier, they had been wailing. You're like, that doesn't make any sense. It's because they had no personal connection to Jairus or his daughter. They were actually hired to do this. That there were people that their job was to actually wail and mourn publicly when someone had died. And so when Jesus says this, that's why they immediately turn on Jesus and they're mocking him when he tells them that she's actually not dead. And so we continue with the remainder of verse 40. So after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother, the disciples who were with him. 
He went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talata kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up. She began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. Jesus heals the second daughter on this day. He'd already healed the first daughter. Now he's going to heal the second daughter, Jairus's daughter. And this is how we want to see the story end. She's dead, but Jesus shows up and he raises her to life. But I just thought it would be important this Mother's Day to just talk about something that can be challenging and difficult and painful to talk about, but sometimes we don't talk enough about these things. But I couldn't help this week as I prayed through this passage, be compelled by the Holy Spirit to know that there's probably somebody here today who walked through a season where your child was sick or your grandchild was sick and and you desperately prayed for God to heal them, just like in this story, but that didn't occur. And you're left wondering why. And you're left with the pain that can be unlike any other pain, the pain of losing a child. I just thought it would be important for us today to just talk about Jesus for a second and, and how Jesus relates to children who are sick when we call on him and we ask him for prayers of healing. And so I'm gonna give you the principle here and then we're gonna take a few minutes just to unpack this. But I think it's important for us to see that Jesus always answers prayers for the healing of children. On this particular day, Jairus' prayer was that Jesus would heal his daughter, and Jesus did. And that still happens. Children get sick, they get diagnosed with terminal illnesses, we pray over them, and we ask Jesus to heal them, and there are testimonies after testimony after testimony where Jesus brings about healing. But listen, from the perspective of eternity, that is a temporary healing. When Jesus brought Jairus' daughter back to life that day, it was a temporary healing. If you've prayed for healing of a child and that child was healed, it's a temporary healing. A temporary healing is where Jesus heals someone in a way where he allows them to experience more time here on this earth. But then there are those times when we ask Jesus to heal a child and Jesus heals the child permanently by calling them home. You see, we believe that when we go to heaven one day, we will be given a new body and all of the sicknesses and ailments from this world will go away. And there's a term that every now and then I get asked about as a pastor. Someone asked me, what does the age of accountability mean? It's a phrase that's actually not found in scripture. It's implied and taught throughout scripture, both in the Old and New Testament. And basically what it means is this, is that God considers children to be innocent to the grace he has granted them until he or she reaches an age, not just where they understand the difference between right or wrong, but they understand the difference between choosing to do wrong in the face of knowing what is right. The implications of that are that when children die before that season of their life, they go to be with Jesus. If you lost a child to illness, that child's with Jesus. If you had a miscarriage, that child is with Jesus. And Jesus healed that child permanently. And while we may be left with the loss, what we hold on to by faith is that one day, when we are with Jesus for all of eternity, we will recognize that it was their gain. That it was their gain. That they got Jesus before we did. That they got out of this world of suffering before we did. That they've been rejoicing at the feet of the Savior before we did. And we will recognize what a good and gracious Savior we have who heals both temporarily but who sometimes heals permanently as well. And I think Jesus gives us some great insight into this whole healing of children with the way the account ends. Verse 43, after healing Jairus' daughter, Jesus gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. I love that. Jesus heals her, and he says, give her a meal. I've healed her temporarily, but she needs a meal. You know, when Jesus heals a child permanently, the first thing he does is that child enters into eternity with him. He offers him a meal. Do you know how I know that? Because scripture is very clear that one day when we're with Jesus, he's going to invite all of us to have a seat at his great banqueting feast. He's gonna share a meal with us. Not because our bodies will be in need of sustenance, but because we will be in the presence of our Savior. 
It's a beautiful picture of how Jesus heals. And for some of you today, you need to be encouraged by that because you need a healing at a heart level, at a soul level. You're walking through something right now. And let me encourage you, Jesus invites you to his table today. Jesus says, you're gonna be with me one day for all of eternity if you've asked me into your life as your savior. But for today, I'm here to commune with you as well. Would you bow your head with me? And as you do, can we just call on the name of our savior to fill this place with his presence? And so Jesus, we're gonna do that right now. We're gonna invite you into this place through the power of your presence. Many of us are walking through painful things. Many of us have let the voices of others define who we are. For my sisters in the house, speak to them, reminding them that you call them a daughter of the king. For my brothers in the house, speak to them, reminding them that you call them a son of the king. Jesus, so many times we're walking through difficult things in need of healing, we forget that we're actually walking from a place of victory. So as we respond to you today, speak to us as your children. Help us to be reminded of this great and glorious truth. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm fighting a battle. You've already won No matter what comes my way I will overcome Don't know what you're doing But I know what you've done I'm fighting a battle You've already won Come on, church. If you're not standing already, please stand with us if you're able, and let's continue to worship. There's peace that outlasts darkness, and hope that's in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today, that Jesus Christ is one. So I can face tomorrow For tomorrow's in your hands All I need you will provide Just like you always have I'm fighting a battle You've already won No Christ, I'll say that it is well.
I don't know what battle you're facing today, but I know who's already won. Cause I know how the story ends. He will be with you again. You're my savior, my defense. No more fear in life or death. Come on, sing it out. I know how the story ends. We will be with you. We will be with you again. You're my Savior. You're my Savior, my Savior. No more fear. No more fear in life or death. All right, y'all. Come on, sing it out with everything you got. already won. So that means that we face the victory today. Thanks so much for joining us in our service and we want to let you know that our team is here for you. We would love to know you and know how to pray for you. So make sure if you have questions about our church or if you're looking to share a praise report or a prayer request, you can check out a link in our description so that our team can connect with you. We can't wait to see you right back here next week as we continue on in this series together. Well, that's never try. Put your hope in.